Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today on measurement risk, uh, measurements gone wrong. Uh, we have a uh, feature presenter today, Henry Zumbrun from Morehouse Instrument Company, uh, who, will present it, who will be presenting on this uh, very interesting topic. Um, so, so welcome to our webinar, Henry, welcome. Uh, Thanks for today, having me, Tracy. Uh, thank you for coming back. I think we had you I think maybe last year on a, on a different topic. So we, we appreciate you joining us again. Um, so today, Henry's going to talk about uh, the risk associated here with, with measurements. And I wanted to bring in a couple points uh, related to ISO uh, 17025 in relation to the presentation he's going to be uh, going over today. Uh, but some of the points he's going to be talking about is really understanding the tasks requested of your customer. Um, that is a requirement in 17025, section 7.1. Uh, we're also going to be talking about the importance of appropriate equipment and your personnel. So, you know, is the equipment suitable for the task you're being asked by your customer? Um, is it uh, calibrated? Also, is your personnel appropriately trained? on this specific task. And then also in relation to 17025 7.8, uh, we'll be talking about making accurate decisions on results and the risks associated with this particular process. Okay, so before we get started, just some webinar housekeeping. Uh, you may already notice, but this webinar is being, uh, is being muted. Uh, you do have the opportunity to put questions, is, questions in the questions toolbar below. Uh, we will be answering those at the, uh, at the end of the call or at the end of the meeting today. This is being recorded, so if you do have to slide off a little early, you will be able to obtain a copy of this recording shortly after the end of this webinar, and it's also available on our website and YouTube channel. Okay, with that, uh, Henry, I will go ahead and let you introduce your, your webinar and yourself, and uh, okay. again, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone. This this webinar, hopefully it's a, a little bit of fun for people, a lot, pulling a lot of examples, and you can see what happens when things go wrong. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us. Your time is important. And the reason we're doing this is because part of our purpose is, you know, at, at Morehouse, we create a safe, we feel we create a safer world by helping companies improve their force and torque measurements. This webinar is not all about force and torque. It's just basically fun, or I shouldn't say fun. It's basically looking at the consequences when bad measurements happen or when people ignore things they should not ignore. So my name is Henry Zumbrun. There is a very accurate picture of me right there. That's exactly what I look like in avatar cartoon form. Uh, so if anybody wanted to know, uh, I think Tracy and Kirsten and everybody else sent out the other pictures. But you can always come to our website. Uh, there's pictures up there. And if you have any questions, I'm happy shoot me an email. Uh, I think I believe uh, PGLA has the PDFs, which we are going to put for copies of this presentation. If, if you want it, want to use them, want to show management, want to show other people, uh, anything there. Uh, again, the goal is just to show what happens when people get complacent sometimes. So let's start. This would be something that I would never want to see when I am on an airplane. And the passenger took that picture. I think this was in the news, my recollection. Uh, I tend to meander a little bit with this stuff or, or uh, wander. And that's because anybody that knows the older you get, time goes so quickly and things just seem like yesterday that were actually months or years ago. Uh, at some point, not to say I'm old, I'm still in my 40s, but uh, it, time is moving a lot faster. This, back to this, this would be something I would not uh, want to see. A uh, passenger took the picture, the plane landed, everybody was safe, that was a good thing. Uh, I'm sure the people on board were pretty frantic and not in the best situation. Then we had this one. This one happened in Florida, which I'll go over uh, in more detail later. They built this span, this walkway, Anybody that's driven on Florida roads knows that they're not fun to drive on, and uh, 
a lot of people in Florida generalizing uh, do not know what a turn signal is. Uh, I get to say that because I, I also go down to Florida for a while and that's an observation, not a fact. Uh, another bridge collapse. And then this one more recent, uh, this one I think we'll probably be hearing for, for a while. Will attorneys and everybody else sort, sort this out? Uh, we are in PA. This happened down in Miami, and one of my friends uh, is an attorney, and they were looking to deal with this. The scope of this, the uh, the apartment collapse, is going uh, is pretty vast in the amount of legal uh, expenditures if it's making its way all the way up to PA for even their firm to be involved with it. So. This course, uh, like session, measurements going whatever wrong, um, but here we have what happens if we do not uh, perform force measurements properly. That's for, for some of the examples that I just showed on the, on the bridges for sure, but uh, it's only, it's almost any measurement. And this session is to help you make the world a bit safer by understanding the consequences of bad decisions. Now, there's multiple decisions that are made every day. Do I pass this? Do I fail this? Uh, as Tracy was saying earlier, what's we were having a discussion before this began about you know the just decision rules and what do we do? Like how do we account for measurement uncertainty? UCAS LAB 48 is a really really good document uh, with that. If anybody wants a, a good good read, uh, which basically puts the decision back onto the customer, and I think that's the intent of ISO IEC 17025 as well, which means the customer should be telling you uh, what they need. And that document's excellent. Uh, it aligns very well with JCGM 106, uh, which is another free document. Uh, all recommended reading if you're into the decision rules and, and want to learn more. And then the, there's paid versions of like ASME and some other ones. But that's not this course. I just wanted to, I always like to mention the UCAS LAB 48 because I think it's a very, very good document. So this one, uh, anybody that knows NCSLI, or the organization NCSLI, great organization, uh, always like to plug them. Though when they were having their annual conference and symposium, this bridge collapsed. And this was out in Minnesota, and it was this official design flaw uh, for the collapse of the bridge was too thin gusset plate that ripped along a line of rivets and additional weight on the bridge at the time contributed to catastrophic failure. And the question then begs for all of us, like they find this after the fact, but did somebody sign off on that gusset plate? Was it ever tested? Did they do, what did they do? What was acceptance criteria? Was it lowest bidder? These are things I do not know. Some things I have lots that I'll talk about. I have report after report uh, given to me by other people that talk about this stuff and they did all the research and then I just got to go read it all and have fun with it. So uh, here's that one in Florida. This one, I thought, just even looking at it, looking at the stretch of this bridge and how it was, or walkway or whatever we call it, I think they, they NT, NTSB said here, the errors were made in the design of the northernmost nodal region of the span where two trust members were connected to the bridge deck and that those errors resulted in an overestimation of capacity and an underestimation of the load placed on that section. So here we have engineers, love engineers. Engineers develop the world that we don't know yet. They're, they create things for us that make our life so much better, um, right? But at the same time, mistakes get made. I, you know, and I don't know if this was tested. There's other things. Someone, uh, Henry Petrosky writes a lot about engineering and to engineer as human. That there's a, a book um, and it is called uh, To Engineer Human and it's just just a fantastic read for anybody that wants to read about engineering failures and some aren't even failures some are just funny anecdotes like speak and spell for anybody that you know I already told everybody I'm in my 40s but yeah when when I was a kid speak and spell was something and that's in the book about how the certain letters were out because they weren't people weren't thinking about how many times they would be pushed and then people would tape over the letters and everything else. It's just a, um, just a, a fantastic read. And in any case, this bridge collapsed in Miami, killing six. And could it have been someone put wrong, you know, they used a stress calculator or used a formula and put a one in instead of a negative one, put a, 
put a decimal in instead of something else, all that. Uh, if we go on and on, you know, I could never find out if uh, the calibration on the machines, I could never find out if there were samples that were tested in this. Maybe they didn't have them. Maybe they were overly confident. I don't know. Uh, I just know that six people did not have to die uh, if things were done properly and correctly. So let's go back in time. Uh, so this one's interesting. Why measurements? matter there was this huge uh warship you can read about it on wikipedia and everything else vasa uh which sank in 1628 less than a mile into its maiden voyage and when they were looking at all of this they found it was built uh asymmetrically and they found out that the different workers uh they found four four rulers uh which were used by different workers and two turned out to be based on the swedish feet with about 12 inches, 30.48 centimeters, and the other two used Amsterdam feet uh, with 11 inches, about 27.94 centimeters. And my takeaway from all of this, I know, is I am now six foot five using Amsterdam feet. So that's what I'm taking away from that. No, but uh, really, what happens if we build things asymmetrically, especially a ship, right? It's not gonna, likely not gonna sail the way it should. Torque, uh, we do a lot of force and torque here. Uh, this one, I, Jeff Nihil's dragster, uh, he's racing, uh, bolts are over torqued, they pop off, uh, left exhaust manifold pops off and 4,000 BHP of exhaust gas launches the car in the air at over 200 miles per hour. So we basically over torqued our, uh, our tires here and created a rocket. So now this, hopefully everybody can see the video. You do not need sound for this if you haven't seen it. Uh, it's one of my favorite videos when it comes to torque control. We have the second most accurate torque calibration machine in the world. It was built by NPL um, and part of the CI, NPL UK, part of the CIPM comparisons. Uncertainty is better than 20 parts per million. So here's the part of the video on why torque control is so important. So bad joke or whatever, but I love what Milwaukee Tools does here. There's no way that's going to flip over. I always get, I, I just found this video to be one of the funnier ones uh, online. So I, I like showing it to people so they can see it. And again, if you want to search that, it's Milwaukee Tools. They have some really clever stuff. This one uh, used to show a video and it was pretty painful uh this is uh you can kind of see maybe the upper left i don't have the screen so it should pull people what this may be uh it just looks like a blurry mess probably before we had uh high definition tvs basically based on standard vhs tape that was copied over and over and over again for those that lived in the 80s um though this is a stealth bomber and the first picture there is on the runway. The second picture is the pilot ejecting. And the third picture there is the fiery mess that happened when a pilot ejected from the stealth bomber. And what I'm told, told different stories from different people, but uh, you can look at this and there were two intertwined causes of the crash. Heavy rains before takeoff caused fuel to get into the data sensors, which were responsible for calculating speed and altitude, amongst other things. And then better picture of the uh, what's left of the stealth bomber. Uh, this was the spirit of Kansas, I believe, and that, that crashed here. The mixture of water and fuel caused condensation to build up on the sensors, which were near the plane's surface. When the maintenance crew were calibrating them before the flight, they were unaware of this buildup, causing them to calibrate them wrong. And what happens when we calibrate a stealth bomber? The altimeter uh, controls a lot of things wrong. Um, and the pilot ejects. It only costs us as taxpayers about $2 billion. So, you know, not much. We have a lot more. I kid. This came from uh, Hype Petrosky's book, and this is one of those, uh, to me at least, it seems egregious 
uh, and it just seems silly that it ever happened. It's absolutely horrible disaster. And basically, on July 17th, 1981, Hyatt Regency Hotel in Kansas City, Missouri, they suffered a structural collapse of two overhead walkways. Loaded with party goers, the concrete and glass platforms cascaded down, crashing onto a tea dance in the lobby, killing 114 and injuring 216. Kansas City society was affected for years, with the collapse resulting in billions of dollars of insurance claims, legal investigations, and city government reforms. Now, that's billions in the 1980s, so that's a lot more money than the billions are today, right? And what happened? Why does this happen? Well, the design vis-a-vis -vis the final construction shown here, uh, the one on the left, A, the original design, for those that are engineers or those that have some knowledge of engineering, uh, or just anybody could probably see that design A is going to carry a lot less than design B. And basically the construction, uh, what they did, there's a big history on this, and it's in uh, Henry Petrosky's group about the boards and submitting and paperwork, and people didn't know this or that. But what they actually built, they submitted for design A, they built design B, and the construction doubled the force on the nut, which is located on the welded joint. And when they went back and looked at this after the failure, it was concluded that even the original design supported only 60% of the minimum load required by the building codes. So what's really bad about this reading Petrosky's book to engineer as human is even the workers, as they were building this, they said the thing was just not stable. It was rocking all around. And that was just, you know, five, six workers just going across these beams. And then they have the party and a lot more weight is on them and a lot more people die. So further investigation uh, concluded that it would have failed even under one third of the weight it held that night. Convicted of gross negligence, misconduct, and unprofessional conduct, the engineering company lost its national affiliation and all engineering licenses in four states, but was acquitted of criminal charges. Don't know how. Uh, in months following the disaster, more than 300 lawsuits sought a cumulative total of three billion. So, uh, which is about equivalent. I, I did the inflation calculator. Uh, it's that's close to about 10 billion today. So, three billion then, 10 billion today. And of that, at least 140 million, uh, equivalent to about uh, 451 million today, was actually awarded to victims and families under the Hotel uh, Crown Center Redevelopment Corporation. Single largest award at that time was about 12 million for a victim who required full time medical care. They never get their life back, right? It's, it's just senseless. Uh, we look at it, it's stupid. What do we learn from it? How do we move on? Uh, the all the warning signs were there when they were walking over there when they were building it uh, It just went unheard and unnoticed. Uh, I guess This uh, as everybody has the PDF. It's about a 10-minute video on YouTube. This is uh, really uh, an interesting situation of with Lake Pinor uh, the video is super old, but uh, basically what happened, November 20th, 1980, an oil rig contracted by Texaco accidentally drills into the diamond crystal salt mine under the lake. Because of an incorrect or misinterpreted coordinate reference system, the rig with the coordinate system uh, set up backwards and a 14 inch 36 centimeter drill bit entered the mine, starting a chain of events that turned a lake from fresh water to salt water with a deep hole. So what's super interesting about this, and I would never have guessed it, is that that 14 inch hole was enough to pull barges. The vortex that that thing created when you watch this video, and, and if, if anybody goes out and watches it, just absolutely amazing. Uh, the amount of water that, that that air sucked everything up into the, the salt mine. It pulled barges down, drastically transformed the area. And there's an old guy there talking with his, um, with his cap in the video. And he was just talking about, you know, for days you'd see barges that were in that uh, lake pop back up. So 
So uh, really, really interesting on on till it I guess till it equalized. But yeah, uh, like I said, anybody can search that. Uh, there it is. It's uh, Lake Kenor. Starting to talk about measurement risk a little bit. Uh, this one a lot of people might remember. I have a picture of the Samsung Note 7, uh, which was a big deal uh, a while ago. I think we're probably eight, nine years ago. But if we look at this and we start talking about measurement risk, and yes, that gets into conformity assessment, and then conformity gets assessment gets into all these fun words that we've created, like PFA, probability of false accept, FAR, false, uh, false accept risk unconditional uh, PFA, conditional PFA, we create all these other fun words, and then uh, PFR, probability of false reject. Though the term that most people know, uh, besides type two, type two um, error, would be something like uh, consumer's risk and producer's risk. And consumer's risk refers to the possibility of a problem occurring in a consumer-oriented product. Occasionally, a product not meeting quality standards passes undetectable, undetected through a manufacturer's quality control system and enters into the consumer market. Uh, if we look at the Samsung Note 7, batteries were overheating. Airlines were asking people if they had the phone not to bring them on. Uh, and the faulty battery charging system of the phone device was approved through quality control process of the manufacturer, which was basically our immetrology, right? False accept or PFA probability of false accept. If you own one of these phones, there was a risk of injury to you, uh, and that's basically it. If then certainly the measurement is not less than the tolerance required, there will be a significant risk of false acceptance. This, I think, shows what I'm trying to say better, um, which I think people have seen this, right, as, as manufacturers um, or as calibration providers. If we follow ANSI Z540, if we file our ILAC G8, there's some degree of risk that a, that the customer is willing to take on. The many standards such as uh, the ILAC G8 2009 had a decision rule, uh, often called the ILAC G8 rule about uh, U, or U95, I've seen it labeled as, which is a specific risk measurement, trying to limit the risk of each tail to two and a half percent. ANSI Z540.3, uh, was before that, and the that standard, the goal was to limit the risk to less than uh, 2.2, .2, uh, basically, they say less than 2%, but it was really less than 2.2%. 2 .2, um, percent. Though, once we look at that, and that's our, that's our PFA, that's the probability of false accept. We wanna make a measurement, and we want to be, we want to make sure that probability of false acceptance is less than X. In most cases, that's less than two to two and a half percent, if that makes sense. In manufacturing, it's um, probability, we use terms probability of conformance and probability of nonconformance. And that gets me on a tangent of why for metrology are we changing terms and making definitions and doing all this other stuff where we could all just stick with the same language. And maybe that would bridge between uh, create a nice bridge between the calibration labs and the testing labs. If we could all just say, let's look, let's instead of using TUR for and test uncertainty ratio, maybe we want to use measurement capability in this. Instead of using this PFA, PFR, FAR, um, all of these, maybe we should just use probability of conformance and probability of nonconformance. It's things we can do. Though I think the Navy has a really nice example of this uh, and where this comes to right, bad and good. Um, in, in our bad scenario, that's our false accept. We have something that doesn't work. A missile would be absolutely horrible that we pass something off as good when it was actually bad. What are, what are the chances of that hitting a target? And on our PFR side, uh, the false reject means, oh, okay, now we're gonna go work on something that we do, do not have to work on. Uh, so those two under the red and bad, and then the good is we accept something that's meant to be accepted, and on the bad side of things, we reject something that actually does need rework, so it will work properly. I really like what NAVC did with this. I, I can't, it just, if you want this, uh, that NAVC document, there you have it, ASQ711.org, uh, to show your your 
people, whoever they are, your decision makers, your coworkers, whomever, I really think that this, this slide really emphasizes the, the PFA, PFR, uh, probability of com conformance and probability of nonconformance stuff quite well. Though I did say measurement capability index, I switch and talk to TUR because that's what most people understand. And that's a, just a simple test uncertainty ratio, right? There are people out there that say, hey, when you say TUR, you should be only talking about global risk, which is a different discussion than what we're having today. And global risk is we're basing something on future results where if we're using specific or bench level risk, we're controlling the quality of individual work pieces or in the now. Um, but for instance, TUR, regardless, if we're global or specific risk, we're, whatever we are, the smaller the measurement uncertainty, really, for the most part, and that is, it should be the smaller the uh, calibration process uncertainty as ANSI Z540.3 uh, uses, the more room we have to be intolerance, the more wiggle room we have to potentially make a mistake or use something different or, you know, we can eat up more spec and we can, if we have more room, we can pass more instruments. We can say, hey, they're, act, they're good and we can reject instruments with more confidence if we have more room. So compare that to you're looking for your, you know, you have X widget and you're looking for a calibration provider to calibrate X, X widget and you're saying, oh, I look at their scope. Scope says they're, you know, have, they're twice, twice as good as I am. Uh, maybe they're one and a half times as good as you, but what does that equate to? That might equate to very little room, uh, depending on that equipment, how the manufacturer spec it, all of that other stuff. So the lab with, uh, you know, those larger uncertainties will produce smaller TURs. And usually I equate that to, if you would just think of this car example, uh, if it's in the winter, for those that are, uh, or the cars are dirty, full of mud, you get out, uh, Women have whatever whatever attire all of us have, blouse, pants, whatever. Chances of us not getting dirty when we get out of that car uh, are, are pretty slim. So that being said, this goes to some risk-based things. Uh, and these come from one of my good friends. I'd like to say I created it. I did not. Uh, Scott Mims, who worked as uh, at NASA, he worked, he worked had a really long career, written a lot of great pa papers. One of those papers is uh, the importance of uh, definitions, which is something that I've been talking about throughout, that we should all speak the same language and why we have five different ways to describe the same thing sometimes just confuses everybody. Though Scott came up with the three, I just added uh, three three legs to the stool. I added the top check and I added the floor and I'm calling the floor continuous improvement. But if we wanted to really look at three rules and then we're gonna have to, the check part of it is after we go through all these, we're gonna run some type of statistical process control or we're gonna run some type of measurement assurance program that ensures that we can, are continually meeting this and the continuous improvement aspect of it can come down to management. What are you doing uh, as managers? How are you having, what culture are you creating? What are your core values, mission, vision? How are you ensuring that your people are present, right? How are your managers, uh, how are they working with your staff and uh, their team? Uh, the thought with COVID, things might change a little bit, but it, it surprisingly, it did not. And it's still 70%. If you have high turnover, 70% of people still leave because of bad managers. That is a high number. And we have a lot of turnover uh, not us personally, but us as a nation, I think everywhere in the world that right now has a, has a lot of turnover if you listen to people. No, back to the, the rules, what you want. I, you know, you wanna do something. So uh, one thing, know the right requirements. And it's pretty easy. The first rule uh, involves knowing what is needed to accomplish the task at hand. Rule number two, choose the right equipment. Always choose measuring and test equipment that is capable of achieving the measurement tolerance required. Rule three, have the right processes. The last rule requires having training program, proof of training, records to validate the individuals performing the calibration or using the equipment. If we go through rule number one, um, 
just some things here I jot these are things I jotted down uh, the more accurate the system the higher the cost will be to procure the equipment and have it calibrated and this just ran a fantastic video that talks about what it takes to get to the next decimal place and it takes typically I like that I like what they were saying in that video uh, it was about a love for measurement but hey if today we can read to 01 tomorrow we want to be able to resolve 001 though that takes a lot more money to get to improve to that extent uh, and that video goes over it really just a great video from from NIST on on that um, and then I bring back TUR here uh, because everybody likes this this four to one whatever uh, you know four times greater uh, th th the origins of that are from the Navy and, and Jerry Hayes and how close he actually was to the magic number for those that do not know, I would love to have a poll on the magic TUR number. And uh, Paul Reese and John Harbin did a paper, and basically they found that regardless of your reliability, your end of peer reliability could be absolutely trash. And a TUR of 4.6 to 1 was the magic number. And what's super amazing about that is how close Jerry Hayes was in 1955 when to just draw a risk curve could take a week, and we can draw a risk curve now in a couple minutes uh, with MathCAD, MATLAB, Excel, some of the other stuff um, is it, just phenomenal if you think back in time to that. But uh, so ANSI Z540.1, which I'm assuming most people are still working on based on poll, not all of us, just some, um, but there's still a large majority. And if you get this, it would ensure that total, total list, two, risk, two sides, to each tail to a normal probability distribution that the total risk is less than 4%. Uh, my other note here, if the requirement is 0.1% of applied and the stability of a device is 0.2% over one year period, uh, anyone think that that's gonna be good, uh, really? Uh, and we see this quite a bit here. Uh, customers send stuff in, they said, okay, uh, my, my tolerance for you to adjust is set that I want you adjusting if it doesn't meet 0.1% and my PFA is higher than two. Okay, PFA is higher than two, accuracy specifications 0.1. Uh, look at the data. Last time it was here was a year ago. This time it's here, it's within 0.15 or 0.2%. Oh, that triggers the decision rule, right? Rule that describes how uh, 0.3.7, how measurement of uncertainty is accounted for. That triggers that adjustment criteria for us. We adjust it. I go look at that lab scope of accreditation and clear as day on their scope of accreditation. They say they're making measurements with a measurement uncertainty of better than 0.1% of applied. And I know for a fact, they're maybe they're making those measurements, uh, maybe you're using them and maybe they're making those measurements within 0.1% of applied. But at some point during that year, this system is continually drifting away from that that actual specification. So maybe month one into the Cal cycle, you're still good if you're using them, but somewhere in six months, seven months, somewhere in there, it's obviously drifting out. If we have three or four years of history that's showing it's never in. Uh, one suggestion there is uh, you could raise your tolerance. The other one I have is really, if they wanna keep that equipment, they should shorten the calibration interval. Uh, I, I regress a little bit on that statement because if you constantly keep tweaking your cal intervals, it's very, very difficult to get reliability uh, specs. I think uh, Howard Castro one time quoted that if you consistently did this with X number of pieces of equipment, that it would take you 60 years to figure out the optimal interval. Not to say not to shorten the interval right now. I'm just saying you you really that's one of several solutions. And maybe the better solution is just to if you only have one of that one piece of equipment where the stability is not that good, maybe the better solution is just consider replacement or buy better equipment with a reliable manufacturer uh, that actually has a good stability spec. So all this talk about rule number one, what happens? Uh, this is a 2007. Uh, quite a interesting uh, study. This is a BP refinery moments before and immediately after the explosion. This is one where I have the uh, full full report, um, and I'll go over basically what happened. The accident distillation tower and attached blow drum overfilled. 7,600 gallons of flammable liquid was released. 
Uh, liquid was ignited by an idling diesel truck. Uh, proximate cause, a uh, high level alarm malfunction. Level transmitter, uh, they determined was miscalibrated. There was an outdated 1975 data sheet. Uh, level transmitter indicated liquid level was falling while it was actually rising. In addition to this, there was like one of these holes that, you know, there was supposed to be a visual cue that people could see what was at, what was going on. And that was all, that was never cleaned. Uh, you, apparently you have to clean that stuff from the inside and that takes draining and doing other stuff. I don't know enough about it. All I know um, that this was bad, uh, right? And it was bad on several levels. And if we go back, the root cause, cost cutting, production pressures, uh, failure to invest, lack of preventative maintenance and safety training, procedural workarounds to compensate for deterior deteriorating equipment. I can't believe uh, no one in this audience has ever seen a procedural workaround. I'd be shocked if they did. Uh, sarcasm uh, injected there uh, for sure. The the cost is was 15 deaths, 180 injured and two billion uh, and with everything else. And then this was, this was uh, Amico. Um, basically, if we, if we went back, uh, CSB report cost cutting in the 1990s by Amico and then BP bought them. BP has a, not, it wasn't doing too well uh, during the uh, 2000s because one of my uh, other favorite movies, uh, love the actor Kurt Russell, there's a, tidbit of things I like. He's in a movie called Deepwater Horizon, uh, which about the BP oil spill. And that's a that's a fantastic, if you want to watch a cool movie uh, about measurements and companies pushing and engineering saying something uh, shouldn't go and then they push it to go and guess what happens? Uh, a lot of people die and, and that uh, to, to spoil the ending. Uh, and the, the Florida Gulf is, has oil everywhere and I believe that was a big cause of red tide, but I'm not 100% sure on that. So rule number two, choose the right equipment. Uh, this is things, I see this all the time, right? If you need to certify that an instrument is within tolerance of 1%, you cannot use a standard with a 1% tolerance to perform the calibration. Well, you can. I know there's people out there smarter than me that says, well, you can. And the magic of that number, I think it's 0.76, but should you? I mean, when you're doing a one-to-one, -one, and I should have added graphs and stuff in here, uh, it's really hard to tell when we were talking about consumer risk and producer's risk. It's really hard to tell what's what unless everything is centered in a line. And we'll, we'll go over that a little bit more later with one of my examples. And then several manufacturers, they don't understand what we're doing if, in the measurement community. They don't understand test uncertainty ratio. Uh, they might not include the instrument's resolution or repeatability or reference standard used to perform the calibration in their accuracy claims. I know manufacturers that take three readings. Uh, I was sitting with a gentleman from from NIST, remains nameless, but we were having lunch together, and he was talking about scales. And he said he asked a manufacturer to uh, the, to see their data, and he said I was shocked when I saw the data. I saw uh one that was over the tolerance one that was under the tolerance and then one that was centered and the manufacturer took the average to do their specification now all of us probably uh, on this group are like who would ever do that people do things um and you can start seeing by that skyway collapse and stuff just shortcuts uh eventually it's gonna bite them uh, and then an important part, uh, statistics to metrology and some other books, uh, we talk about TUR, but very rarely do we measure, do we mention that uh, a lot of the assumptions are that your process is centered or that you're, uh, when you're talking TUR, that everything is centered on the global, when you're looking at global risk models, which is taking a lot of averages, some other things. If anybody's interested in uh, risk course, we have them. Uh, so, but choose the right equipment. Here's one. I wasn't sure if I wanted to add this in or not, but I, I really did because this is uh, commercial weighing. Uh, good equipment. Manufacturer's good. I, I don't have many problems. It, it's the, the theory of how this is designed. It's a tension link. And really, the way it's gauged and the way it's designed, and they use these with cast iron pins, 
And what I'm showing is if we have pin A and B and the Q1, Q3 and whatnot, if we rotate those pins around, uh, that will get different results. And the reason this got us into trouble initially is customer sends us uh, an instrument like this and we mark one of the pins you get, you get back with a sharp, very Sharpie or paint pen that says top and puts an arrow and says bottom and puts an arrow. And the reason we do that is so when the customer uses it, they can, they can put those pins in exactly the same way that they were calibrated. Now, do you need to do that? Uh, if we look at the data, the, we measured the pins here, the maximum variation was like 003 inches on pin B and 004 inches on uh, pin A. And out of 24 tests, 13 didn't meet spec. And that's just by randomizing and loading those conditions. So somebody might say, I have this data, I wanna use this. Uh, this might be a case where someone says, look, the spec is 0.1% of, full scale maybe for what i need to measure all i'm happy if it's uh 0.2 percent and at 0.2 percent all but one of these measurements what they're all in but one is on the line and when something's on the line uh if anybody knows that we talk about pfa pfr if something is exactly on the line and you pass it that's 50 percent of the risk you're taking and you're giving the customer that's taking the device 50% of the risk. No PFA, PFR, they both become 50%. Consumer and producers become 50% because we're right on that tolerance line. And we cannot differentiate whether it's in or out based on being on that line. I could have the highest TUR in the world. I could have the best measurement process in the world. And uh, if I'm using specific risk, if I'm using global risk, now that, that changes things a little bit. And I don't want to confuse people on global and specific, but uh, in any case, uh, I went there. So there, just things to consider. Uh, another one, and I know this is a debate, so I want to show people what, what happens with it. And if we look at calibration process and certainty, or better yet, if we look at ILAC P14 section uh, 5.4, where it talks about uh, what do we include uh, on our report on for uncertainty? And this is for calibration labs. Testing labs do not have to follow ILAC P14, though it's a great document. Uh, what do we report? And typically it says the short-term contributors that were used for your, uh, I don't have it in front of me, but it says the short-term uh, contributors that were used uh, for your uh, reference uh, CMM, CMC, calibration and measurement capability, with the exception of the customer stuff will be substituted with the best existing, uh, all of that. So typically we're gonna include resolution, um, we're gonna include repeatability, we're gonna include environmentals, we're gonna include all this other stuff. But what, what the purpose of this is here for is just to show you a quick get around of all this. If we don't have to, uh, and there's an argument in place that says, oh, the resolution tanks my measurement capability index or the measure or the resolution of my UT just tanks my uh, test uncertainty ratios. So fine, right? If there's a load cell, this one we manufacture, there's a meter, um, it's, it's one that uh, we, we rebrand re that meter. Um, and here's one where we, we set the resolution to 01 and Okay, so if resolution doesn't matter, what happens if we set to a really coarse resolution, like one count out of one pound out of three thousand? This is a competitor cert to remain nameless, but I saw it and I said I have to I have to call this to attention because it's exactly what happens when we have a coarse resolution, and that is all of our measurements at some point become perfect, right? Standard deviation zero, standard deviation to the span zero percent. This is an ASTM cal, but everything's perfect, no error whatsoever. So that one I think was set to uh, half pound, um, half pound resolution on uh, on a three thousand pound load cell, six thousand counts, very very low. But then. Um, Here's a, another slide. So I, I graph this out. So if, if we just wanted, to, we start with the, the bottom piece here. We start with 001 uh, on our resolution. I think I have a pen here. I can call attention to it. Uh, so start with 001. And then we just say, okay, what if it was 01? What if it was 02, 03? 
But if you go TUR with and without resolution, without resolution never changes. In, in this scenario, we have 6.25 to one. With resolution, it just tanks as we get to that 0.2 or, or one, right? It, uh, it absolutely tanks. And Scott Mims in his one paper, The Importance of Decision, I think this, this came from there actually. Um, when resolution is not accounted for, the TUR ratio stays Point one, uh, but Scott in his paper, I think he showed a, a micrometer that was like 25 to one and ended ended at 1.7 to one. So really, sometimes all we have is that resolution uh, to make a make a decision. Whether you agree with me or not, it's uh, it's it might be the only thing that separates us in, in a room if we're all if we're all reading an analog gauge. Uh, even if we're all reading a digital gauge that's kind of fluctuating a little bit, I might say something's a two that someone else might say is a one and visa V. Uh, anyway, so rule three, have the right process. This is that training records. Uh, ISO uh, is very prescriptive in this and to validate the individuals performing the calibration or using equipment. I like good R and R testing. I like blind stuff. I like a lot of different things for uh, for uh, training and to, and to see if there is a statistical difference between technicians. And I also love the book, uh, Checklist Manifesto. If you have not read it, two books, I could recommend hundreds of books, but the two books out of this session I would recommend are Henry Petrosky's To Engineer a Human, and I'll show a picture of that. And the second one for anybody that's in quality, and I cannot say the gentleman's name, but the book is called The Checklist Manifesto. And when I say I cannot say his name, I could attempt to, but I'd say most likely 50% chance I'd say it wrong. So I choose not to because it's in my head and I want to say it. But uh, uh, if you just looked at uh, Checklist Manifesto, it is one of the best books. And the Reader's Digest version of this is if you have a quality procedure that's 8, 10, 20 pages, whatever it is, it's probably too long. Maybe it's not. Though the major thing is at the end of that procedure, the recommendation is to put a checklist. And through that book, Checklist Manifesto, it talks about different teams in the hospitals uh, specifically and how many lives they save just from going through the checklist. If somebody gave somebody an overdose of this or that, they check, they do this, they do that, everything. Uh, it just improves the success rate. But when we get back to quality uh, of things, if you have a 20 page procedure and your tech has read that and the tech has read it two or three times, do you really want to pay them to go back through and read it over and over again? Or would it make a lot more sense for the checklist where they can just go through? Yep. Did that. Yep. Oh, Hey, I'm fuzzy on step three. Oh, that's on, that's on uh, page three of the procedure. Maybe I go back and, and do that. Uh, maybe I go back and reread that. So, just highly recommend that book, how you how you would use it or anything else. It's one of the better books out there, uh, like I said, especially for quality folks. But back to the right process. Uh, it's important to maintain and follow procedures that adequately support the end product performance. Uh, should be a process in place that ensures all aspects of standards are being carefully satisfied in the calibration process. And for four specifically in some other mechanical disciplines, uh, electrical too, right? Your contacts, what you're using, um, uh, use of proper adapters and making sure the instrument's calibration matches how it's being used in the field or lab. That, uh, we do classes on adapters and some of those, the errors, you know, could be, can push 20 times that of manufacturer specification. I have some that push 50 times the manufacturer's specification. If people start changing hardness of materials, if they do different thread depths, if they do this, if they don't design the right adapters, it's, uh, and I'm gonna show you one right here, so we'll just go to that. Um, I hopefully no one knows who this is. Uh, I should have, uh, uh, I debate whether to use this in, in slides or not. I do like the company. Uh, I just hate this marketing spec, and if you look at it, it says, hey, the, 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 the promotion here is this is an accurate way to measure torque. Uh, but if we look at it and we know torque, you know, lift and sign of the wrench and the angle, if I just look at this picture, we can all guess, uh, I'm saying 45 degrees, maybe it's 40 degrees. We'd all have a different angle going through here and here. Uh, that's not our, that's not the problem with this. The, the, the main problem is we can all, criticize this or critique it 
Uh, though the main problem is this picture really needed to be shot with a 90 degree angle. And then we would say something about safety or something else. But the way they're showing this is an accurate measure way to measure torque. This error is probably going to be at least 20%. Uh, if, if it's 45 degrees, the error is going to be 29%. And unless the customer is okay with something plus or minus 30%, uh, I've not seen it. Uh, maybe somebody else has seen it. I don't think this is a good way to measure torque. And this is what we get at when marketing. Uh, the purpose of this slide, again, is, is just for mar on the marketing side of things, uh, mark Several marketers are not metrologists, but when this stuff goes out into the world, people that people that build that uh, skywalk and the other stuff, they look at this. An engineer might see it. Well, an engineer should know better, but somebody else might see it and say, look, I'm on the production floor. Somebody has this requirement. This is what I'm going to do. They're going to give it to a bunch of people. They're going to you see those things in the background. They're going to give it to them and someone's going to say they're good there. And most likely, back to uh, our discussion on reporting measurement uncertainty, uh, most likely they don't report the measurement uncertainty on the certificate. The lab, the test lab says, yeah, I use this, this, this. Uh, and then you find out they use this method and anything they tested is probably not good. Um, so I always, always big proponent of, of doing those calculations properly, whether they're needed or not. Uh, Here's just the load cell cal uh, rate process. If you know, it's the E74 standard. E74 basically says the first point uh, must be a non-zero force point defined by 400 times the resolution, and zero can meaning that zero cannot be the first point. And then it says the verified range of forces shall not include forces outside the range of forces applied during the calibration. So at this point, what what happened is 100 they they told the company says you can use this load cell from 192.3 pounds to 10,000 in actuality if you follow the standard it needed to be 500 pounds because of the way the standards written it's some nuances in there but it's a good example of of really understanding the standard because we've seen that a lot somebody reads the standard doesn't know about it a customer ask them to make a calibration in accordance with this or follow it and all of a sudden they do things that they don't know any better. So they just do it. So uh, this one, this is uh, Cox Lab, uh, Cox Health, uh, 152 cancer patients, uh, 76 of which received up to 70% than higher prescribed dosages. This is a brain lab stereo or attic radiation system. Uh, used to treat 1.1 centimeters or smaller, and it was initially incorrectly calibrated by Cox Health's chief physicist. So that's the important piece here, incorrectly calibrated by the chief physicist. Error goes undetected for five years um, until somebody else receives proper training. Wow, wow yay. Uh, and then although the calibration error was corrected as of February 2012, uh, the program remains suspended, and there are numerous lawsuits. Here, uh, this one's more recent, if people can remember uh, the cranes falling, structures falling. Uh, it's lower margins of safety existed. Uh, it's, it's really a pain in the butt uh, th that some of the people have to do. They have to put the, a bunch of pins in to brace it. Uh, they like to remove them early. And it's basically, they say practice has become common in the industry uh, and because it's a way to save time during disassembly uh, despite the safety risk. But no one had to die here. Somebody takes some extra time in the process. The winds, winds this, I think this is Seattle, wind blew uh, crane. There was one in Texas. Here's a famous one. Hubble Space Telescope launched April 24th. Uh, HSC could not be properly focused. Ensuing investigation of primary Mir was not built to specifications. A uh, servicing mission to correct error was flown in December at a cost of over $1 billion. That's a cool IMAX movie narrated by Leonardo DiCaprio. If anybody's a fan, I recommend the movie. It's very cool. So let's look at this. Uh, there's a lot on this slide. So they had this specification here, and then they had these different test methods, INC, uh, RVNC, and then uh, the RVNC is standard for producing the uh, telescopes. High confidence is placed on the one method, uh, the RNC, and uh, the two other methods here, the INC and RVNC, were dismissed. Um, 
and they should not have been dismissed because they had adequate adequate accuracy to reveal the error. The situation mandates investigation before an acceptance decision is made. And then here's from the NASA report. It says the consistency of the data from INC and the RVNC indicates the presence of error in the RNC. So we look at that uh, and we go on. Uh, if we go on to this slide, this is uh, one, uh, uh, again, Steve, Scott Mims. This was, uh, I mentioned the other person thing earlier, Paul Reese, uh, just fantastic uh, metrologist. And this one shows um, the 0.4 wave error. And if we look at it, insert it under RNC in place of mirror, used to check components of the RNC by simulating perfect primary mirror. INC accurate to 0.14 RMS showed RNC error. This is what they were looking for of uh, 0.4. Spec was 04, and it actually showed it. So this was easily good enough to re reveal the 0.4 wave area for outside the 04 wave spec. And guess what? Finding was dismissed. That's the real story. But you go to the internet, and I just went in our lab today because I said I was giving this talk, and they said, oh, yeah, the Hubble Space Center. Wasn't that a speck of paint? Uh, okay. So there's internet theory. You, you know the real story about the testing methods and, and what they did. and there's what you get on the internet. Uh, Spec of distorted it, uh, and only at a cost of about a uh, billion dollars, is what they say. But another billion to fly it up, probably at least over two billion dollars to fix, uh, just because we discounted something. So calibration provider always important. Uh, has a measurement process capable of meeting your needs. Uses right adapters competent technicians, published standards, and rated high. We're, we're having a PowerPoint point here while I'm talking and, and veering a little bit, but uh, here's a death by PowerPoint. Uh, this is 9 a.m. February 1st, 2003, Space Shuttle Columbia, you know, uh, enters the atmosphere for those that remember. Uh, research showed that despite years of engineering and planning, the downfall could be attributed to technical communication failure following the debris damage and prior to re-entry. In simple terms, years of engineering work from the smartest minds the world has ever offered were undone by the few PowerPoint slides. The reason I'm showing this is that uh, there's a book. It's called Words That Work. It's not what you say, it's what people hear. And if you look at this slide, it says everything on it. Um, it says this, the point here is that while the data showing that the tiles on the shuttle wing could tolerate being hit by the foam, this was based on a test condition using foam more than 600 times smaller than what had struck Columbia. Um, and this is what the slide that engineering used to illustrate that point. So you can see once tile is so far can cause significant damage. And then minor variations in total energy above penetrate can cause significant tile damage. It's like, OK, someone should have been screaming that this thing's probably going to burn up uh, on reentry. But that's what we got. Other things, uh, I'm wrapping up here. I know we go to two, so uh, a couple more slides. This is what happens when a smaller pin is used for tension link or crane scale calibration and driving force behind our patent kit. So our kit basically shows with the pin size that should be used, small pin, large hollow. Never a good idea with force measurements, and that's what you get. Yeah, you get a bent pin. Fortunately, no one died in that, and it's a, uh, a few hundred dollars uh, plus replacement cost. Uh, this one, uh, we got a call that the person, the, the actual customer said, hey, this is always out when we send it in. And we said, well, what are you doing with it? And this is a compression, which means push gauge. And here we find out that they bought a compression instrument and they're using it for a full test. And the test does not look that safe anyway on the forklift. Uh, then my son, I showed the picture of the... Uh, the bolts on Jeff Niles uh, dragster. Uh, this one where my son goes to get his tires uh, rotated and they, we think they under, actually on this one, we think they over torqued the one nut and under torqued the rest. And hence the tire falls off, he's going down the road and uh, his girlfriend's father uh, going to see his girlfriend and the girlfriend's dad was nice enough to go pick him up, get the tire and get him situated because uh, he was about five hours away from us. But uh, uh, not a good situation. So conclusion here, as as we are at the two o'clock, and I'll stay on for questions. 
Uh, engineering failure is measured in two ways, human death toll and materials lost. Uh, that's a lot of the time. And then my favorite quote by Henry Petrosky, which I'll read, failures appear to be inevitable in the wake of prolonged success, which encourages lower margins of safety. Engineers and the companies who employ them tend to get complacent when things are good. They worry less and may not take the right preventative actions. So, I mean, this, this claim about com complacency might merely describe human nature. Uh, it might just be that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Uh, the motto has haunted our society in various ways, uh, from that BP Texas refinery, right? Cost cutting, production practices, lack of preventative maintenance, procedure workarounds, and collapsing to, to the end there, collapsing cranes due to premature removal of pins that they probably did for years and years until it got windy some days. Um, and yeah, I thank everybody for their time. You know, please join us in educating the people who underrate the importance of following the standards, asking the right questions, using proper machines and adapters. Using what was presented today, I hope you can help us create a safer world by helping companies improve their for I say force, I keep that slide, that's what we do, but just improve all their measurements. It applies to everybody. So that said, uh, if you want, uh, I love when people follow us on LinkedIn. I have a goal uh, that I want to hit by the end of the year. But if you follow Morehouse on LinkedIn, uh, that's where we announce new stuff. If you like this, risk articles. I have about five risk articles. I was going pretty quick on global and uh, global and specific or bench level risk. Uh, all those differences, and we publish those there. Uh, we put the stuff on LinkedIn. So, yeah, or, or just connect with me on LinkedIn. I, I like to have friends. Who doesn't like friends? So, free downloads and the other stuff. So, from that, I guess uh, we'll we'll let this uh, kick off for uh, Q and A, and then there's some announcements by uh, PGLA, which I'll I'll put here as we're doing uh, Q and A. Uh, so you can look for uh, Thursday, October 26. Overview of the requirements of 6.4 and Wednesday, November 8th, uh, a virtual su uh, summit. So uh, register through there. But uh, all right. So I think that. Thank you yeah. so much. I'm going to just check your see if you have any questions here that uh, came in. If you just give me a second here. No problem. We can pull how many people fell asleep. Is it 50%, 20%? Hold on. What was your what was your question? Oh, I don't have any. I was just okay. I was joking. We can poll people and see if anybody fell asleep. So I, oh, I always no. laugh because it, it's the virtual world. We're going somewhere into somebody's office, home, wherever. Uh, okay. Uh, someone just made a comment. I'm guessing you're from the family of Harry Zumrun. Very cool. What is a proving ring? What is a proving ring? Well, it's a ring that proves things out. Now, a proving ring is a steel alloy, uh, almost perfectly cylindr cylindrical. It was made, um, the design originally was made by NIST uh, back in NBS, uh, National Bureau of Standards in 1925, in which case my grandfather helped design. Uh, they signed in about May, uh, I forget the exact date, but in May they signed an agreement to work with NBS and my grandfather helped help perfect the design. So it's, uh, it's a ring with nearly uniform stress distribution and if you remember a micrometer, uh, how a micrometer works, there's a dial on it. So from about 1925 to really about 1980 they, they were probably the one of the more reliable force instruments now load cells are so prevalent and easy to use that uh, it's just simplistic sake but some people have rings and they work they work really well uh, they they really hold their cow it's just that uh, their operation takes a lot more skill than a load cell so hopefully that explains it or you can go to our website mhforce.com uh, and uh, and see pictures of them do have another question for you. Um, sure. How are calibration intervals decided between the calibration facility and the customer? And is there a standard for intervals? Uh, oh, that is a day day answer, but I'll, I'll do the, uh, the super, super cliff notes. So if it's inherent in the standard, like ASTM basically says to assign a two year in uh, section 11.3, it defines the criteria that needs to be met. If that's not met, that standard says the end users to shorten the in interval to ensure that it is met. Now, intervals, reliability, and, and all that other fun stuff that we're looking at, it's very 
difficult to, uh, as part of 17025, all we could do is we can't assign an interval for you. We can discuss things with you. And during that discussion, it would be how do you use the, the equipment? What do you expect? Uh, and it's on that, I, I keep thinking of this drawing Scott has uh, on calibration. You make a you, you do a design, you make a calibration uh, in the initial phase, then you then you tweak it, then you do a cal and make it and tweak it. Do um, in any way with intervals, it's uh, your more reliability. So if you want to know uh, this, there's a formula for that. I have it on our on our website. Uh, it's it's in a, if you ask our chat but uh, Mura. Measurement uncertainty resource assistant. It will tell you uh, the 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 formula. Though, if it it all depends on your confidence level and your end of period reliability. So numbers I know off the top of my head is if I wanted 95% confidence with 95% end of period re reliability, I would have to demonstrate. I would have to have 58 passes, 58 items that pass. So if my spec was I wanted my device to be better than 0.5% at 95% confidence, 95% end of period reliability, I would need to prove that out. I would need to have uh, 58 um, devices meet that criteria. And I just wrote a paper. Uh, I'm happy to put that, in fact, I hope I don't bomb this as I'm sorting, but uh, thinking about this and that question, love the question, and I'm happy to give you a link to that uh, paper, which will ha should help uh, answer that question. Okay, we have two more that came in. If we can. See okay, them. great. Yeah, no, no, great. I'm I'm looking for that. Uh, I'm this just gonna right. put this in the chat here if I can okay. use the. Uh, uh, um, it says I know I I know the client is the one that sets the tolerance, um, but to be honest, not many do. Any read you would recommend to help them decide? Uh, this one that I just sent you, I like the question. Uh, what are the other reliability? Uh, Z540 is pretty, Z540.3 handles pretty, uh, yeah, they're not. I, th that's a great question. I, I would need to get back to you on that. Uh, there's, there are a lot of reliability documents that are out there, but there's uh, observed versus true. There's some things, um, the short of it is, is there needs to be better explanation and documentation. And knowing what I know, run rules and everything else, uh, yeah. uh, there's a mill handbook for reliability. I just, all, off the top of my head, I would probably say that paper. Fluke has some stuff um, out there too. Uh, maybe the mill handbook, uh, NASA had like Apollo mission stuff on reliability, uh, but I, nothing's really off the top of my head just saying that this is this is it. Uh, I, I would look for the NASA documents. Uh, uh, they're, they're, it's all about, cali calibration is all about reliability. I, I just wanna know that my device is gonna continue to be good and then I'm gonna have that confidence, I'm gonna use the right lab and have confidence in my measurements that I can use this year after year, month after month or whatever the, uh, frequency is and, uh, and that it'll meet the needs and that's that's part of that those three rules but uh, excellent question uh, I wish I had a de facto document all I can say is introduction to statistics in in metrology is a great book I recommend reading and uh, pull up some NASA reliability documents uh, those those are very very good okay one last uh, comment and I'm gonna probably answer this one for you somewhat um, can I give your presentation to my metrology students at CSUDH with all credits, of course. I, I think that uh, I recommend yeah. um, that they maybe contact you directly. This this does go publicly on our website, but I, I, I think, Henry, you should work with them to get grant your permission through uh, a separate email. I think on the next slide, you have your emails and contacts, right? Oh, uh, I, I had it at the beginning. Yeah, if, if, if that's there, you have the website address, you can come in. Look, uh, yeah, some of this was given to me by Scott Mims, and we're authorized to share. I'm, I'm more than happy if you want to do the, if, if you want these slides, I'm more than happy to, as long as you put, you know, Scotts and, and the other people, Scott, me, and um, Paul. I used a slide by Paul Reese in here too, but yeah, I'm, yeah, uh, I don't it, slice it up. Uh, give the give the examples and notes and everything else. I'm, you know, if it's going to help people make better measurements, the answer is yes.
<laughs> okay, great. I think that's all for the questions. Um, like Henry had said, the next webinar we have, but these are both complimentary to you, is October 26th uh, with Mike Creamer um, going over the overview of requirements specified for equipment, something we sort of talked about a little bit today. And then there is an outside webinar, Matthew Sika, our testing program manager, will be doing with Ideagen um, on levering, uh, levering technology to improve quality. That's not on our website, but if you go to the Ideagen website, you can register. They have a whole series um, going on uh, that's going to be played on that day. Um, one thing that I did not mention um, was that uh, we do have a class coming up uh, in the end of October. It's on our website. Uh, 17025 overview um, and uh, it's an online uh, web course at the end of October so please take a look at that we also have one running in February um, again an online class that a lot of people have been looking forward to uh, to taking from us so uh, with that Henry I, I really appreciate you uh, participating on our webinar today your slides were very interesting um, I, I love the the stories that you gave behind it really relates to our industry and I hope you can come back again with uh, some other topics you have and uh, please visit Henry's website. Uh, I said a lot of training tools on there um, and information uh, out there for you. So with that, uh, again, Henry, thank you very much. And well, thank you for having me and, and thanks to all the uh, uh, attendees uh, there. Uh, your time is valuable and you know, thanks for listening. Okay, great. Everyone, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.